fear and intimidation in Burundi. Opposition figures accuse the governing party of cracking down on its critics ahead of next year's election. So what are the chances of a free and fair vote and how can human rights be protected? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the program. I'm Nastasia Tay. Now, Burundi has long been criticised for silencing dissent. Human Rights Watch has described the killing, rape and intimidation of political opponents. And with a presidential election set for next year, Burundi is again coming under scrutiny. Opposition groups say the governing party is attacking them and creating a climate of fear. But the government rejects those allegations and insists the vote will be free and fair. We'll bring in our guests in a moment, but first, this report from Catherine Soy in Bujumbura. Protected by Imbonerakure, you can't cross. Memories of what happened four years ago remain raw for this man. He tells us his young son was shot by police while on his way to buy bread. Riots started in 2015 when President Pierre Nkurunziza ran for and won a third term that his opponents said was unconstitutional. Street protests, a failed coup, vigilante-like attacks and assassinations threatened to tear the country apart. Another election is due next year and the bereaved father says people are still being intimidated by security forces and members of the ruling party youth wing called Imbonerakure. Talking to you is putting me at risk. If the police know I'm talking, all my neighbors find out and tell I can be arrested or was killed. People here have not forgotten Burundi's history of war. At this ceremony, they celebrate men and women who fought in another conflict in the 1990s. The fighting stopped after an armed opposition group brought President Pierre Nkurunziza to power. He promised civil liberties, ethnic cohesion, and improving people's livelihoods. At the height of the conflict, people could not use this road because of the intense fighting. President Nkurunziza and other revolutionaries are credited for bringing peace and keeping the country relatively stable. But now some people accuse him of abusing the same rights he fought for all those years ago. To those people saying uh, uh, all those evil things on Burundi, I just have one word. They just need to, to repent because they are spreading false and fake news on Burundi. They are not here to see uh, where Burundi is now and uh, what evolution and what progress the people have made. Some opposition leaders say Burundians have no freedom to express themselves, many have been forced into exile and independent media organizations remain shut. Many people in the administration are just trampling on the constitution and nothing care. They are trying to, to secure space for the only thing they have, the day and it's allies, and others are suppressed. After all, this father who lost his son so brutally hopes politics will not drive the country to the edge again. Catherine Soy, Al Jazeera, Bujumbura, Burundi. Now, Burundi's struggle for political stability goes back for decades. It fought a 12-year-long civil war that began in 1993, in which nearly 300,000 people were killed. In 2015, President Pierre Nkurunziza won a third election, despite allegations of corruption, and that triggered violent confrontations between protesters and security forces in which hundreds were killed. And last year, the result of a constitutional referendum allows Nkurunziza to serve for another 15 years. Human Rights Watch says Burundi's governing party continues to commit abuses against its opponents. And Kuruziza's critics have been killed, arrested or forced to flee. Well, let's bring in our guests now. There's Angela Movumba Selstrom, who is a peace and conflict researcher at Uppsala University and also an expert on the Great Lakes region. She joins us now on Skype from Uppsala. Well, in London, we have Jonathan Ofe Ansa, who is the founder and publisher of Africa Briefing, a pan African news magazine. And in Burlington, Vermont, via Skype, Lewis Mudge, the director for Central Africa at Human Rights Watch. Welcome to you all. 
I do want to start with the situation on the ground. Um, so there is the, the, well, the United Nations Human Rights Council has this commission of inquiry. They've been reporting on what's been happening in Burundi for some time now. Um, and they, they describe this climate of fear, arbitrary disappearances, arrests, executions, this, quite this list of horrors. And I want to read you something that they said when they launched their latest report in September. They said, it is extremely dangerous to speak out critically in Burundi today. The stifling of such voices is what allows the country to present an illusion of calm, but it is a calm based on terror. Angela, talk us through what life is like on the ground in Burundi at the moment. Well, I think that life, it varies considerably. I mean, I, I think that there is a, sh there's a shared sense of, of political sort of upheaval and uncertainty. But I think that those individuals who are really strongly in support of the ruling government of the CNPD FDD live in considerably less fear than those individuals and families and communities that have either been um, less involved, you know, they've been marginally involved in politics and they've tried to stay out of out of the, the melee, or they are real strong supporters of the opposition, either the opposition in the country or outside of the country. But I think for young people in particular, uh, today life in Burundi feels uncertain, um, quite precarious, uh, both in terms of, particularly in terms of their socioeconomic uh, situation, but also, of course, in terms of whether or not they can speak out openly, criticize the government, um, and challenge the government at all. Well, it seems that this UN Commission of Inquiry is really the only kind of external objective body that's actually reporting on human rights um, in the country at the moment that, that's, you know, from a, a large body that is then reporting to the international community. And I'm curious because even they struggle for access. I believe the, the UN office has been shut down. Um, they've been declared persona non grata. Um, and all the requests that they've put in for information from the the government in Burundi have gone unanswered. So, Lewis, let me ask you this. How difficult is it to know what's going on in Burundi at the moment? It's, it's incredibly difficult, and it's difficult for a variety of reasons. Number one, as you just alluded to, access um, for you know, groups like Human Rights Watch, of course, but also for the United Nations. Um, as you just said, the UN human rights uh, body was shut down. Access is incredibly difficult. Um, and so groups such as ourselves were forced to work outside of Burundi. We're working in the refugee camps um, in its neighboring countries. We're talking to people who've just fled. And we're doing interviews with people inside the country, but very discreetly, uh, which alludes to the second point, which is um, in no unclear terms has it been made to us that if the authorities in Burundi know that someone is speaking to the UN Commission of Inquiry, for example, or a group like Human Rights Watch, their lives are in immediate danger. Um, even international journalists, you know, if, if someone denounces what is happening outside uh, Burundi to an outside source that can then project that message, um, their lives are, are very much in danger. And we've documented numerous cases in which people have been accused of, of, of leaking information outside the country. So the abuse that we're happening, that's happening, that, you, that you're talking about, and that your, your guest Angela just spoke to, this is very much trying to be done, this abuse is trying to be perpetrated in the shadows. Um, and so it's very important for programs such as these to, to really try to amplify what's happening in advance of these upcoming presidential elections. Lois, you're talking about all of these things happening in the shadows. And Jonathan, I want to bring you in here because there have been... I guess, some confusion about who's really in charge. And Kuraziza has a council of generals, I believe. There are a number of different shadowy organizations here. So who is really calling the shots at this stage? Yes, um, what is going on in the country now is um, a remnant you know, of the um, conflict in 2015 when um, President Kuraziza decided to um, unilaterally um, extend you know, his mandate. And as uh, the previous uh, speakers, you know, um, pe people on the panel said, um, uh, human rights, you know, are being trampled upon, you know, with impunity. You know, there were even reports recently of uh, about four um, journalists, you know, who were detained, hmm. uh, who, who have been detained, you know, yeah, on the grounds of, uh, national, of being a threat to national security and so on and so forth. So the situation, you know, as the UN report said, the situation hasn't actually uh, improved. The only 
the only um, uh, 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 silver lining is a uh, inclusive's uh, decision not to run for elections um, next year. But apart from that, the situation has not improved at all. I mean, refugees, more than 1.8 million refugees you know, are outside the country. You know, and so for everything to be, um, to be, to be done properly, you know, measures need to be put in place. You know, we have the, uh, the regional economic grouping, the ECA, and then um, the, the, uh, the, the, and other groups uh, within the region too, who need to step in, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, and make sure that that national dialogue that has been uh, proposed, that national dialogue takes place. So all this needs to be done to make for a very credible, free and fair elections next year. So some very big questions there, which I do want to come back to, but I do want to touch on this and um, this group, the Imbonaka, the Imbona, sorry, let me say that again, the Imbona Rakure, the youth wing of the ruling party, right? And, and ultimately, it's, it's quite informal, but it is a, a large amount of young men operating seemingly with impunity. Um, Jonathan, I'm, I'm going to come back to you in a second, but Lewis... They seem to be operating without oversight, but now we're starting to see reports of these, these militias, essentially, um, taking the place of more formal um, military groups. Um, what kinds of trends have you been seeing? Yeah, just to be clear, you say militias, essentially. That is absolutely right. We consider the Mbonara Kuri to be a youth militia of the ruling party, not the government. So they are extra governmental. They are not tied to the government. They work for the party in of themselves. And they are effectively enforcers. They enforce a uh, party line. They enforce fidelity to the party. Um, this is something that we, we've been seeing the Mbonara Kuri. I myself was documenting in the abuses by the Mbonara Kuri in Kanyosha outside of Bujumbura in 2011 and 2012. We've been seeing the Mbonara Kuri used um, to, as repressive body. But what we're seeing now is new territory. Now, outside the capital, we're seeing the Mbonara Kuri being considered stronger than the police, being considered stronger than the Hill administrators um, in, in, the, in, the, in the countryside. Uh, we're seeing the Mbonara Kuri arbitrarily detain people. They have absolutely no mandate to do that. Uh, we're seeing the Mbonara Kuri beat people in public, and we've documented numerous instances of killings perpetrated by the Mbonara Kuri. So the fact that, uh, you know, the, this is not a new trend, this has been happening for about, you know, at least 10 years in Burundi, actually a few more. Our first report on the Mbonara Kuri was exactly 10 years ago, 2009. Um, but what we're seeing, which is incredibly worrying, is, is this is amplifying. This is becoming more and more of an open, overt trend. A few years ago, there was always some middle ground between the government administrators and the Mbonara Kuri. And now that's, that line seems to have been crossed in which the Mbonara Kuri are really calling the shots. Hmm. Um, and so it's a very, very worrying trend that the party... Uh, feels it necessary to fall back on this youth militia, which are the enforcers, which enforce fidelity, instead of working through normal state structures such as the police um, to, to ensure security. I see you nodding there, Angela, and I do want to bring you in here because one of the things that Lewis didn't mention there are these widespread allegations also of sexual violence. I know you've done quite a lot of work on that, Angela. What, what kinds of... I guess, allegations are we seeing? Um, well, what, what's happening now in Bujumbura? So the, the sorts of allegations are very much related to what, to the involvement of the Mbonera Kure, but also the police and, and other authorities. Um, you know, uh, CNDD, FDD, uh, as, a, as, a, as a political actor, both uh, as, a gov as a ruling party, um, but also pre in the previous civil war between 19, in the 1990s and early 2000s, um, also had some sexual violence occur, um, take place uh, by its, its members. And really what, what we saw in the past was, was that the CNDD FDD didn't try to take great pains to prevent sexual violence, to discipline its fighters. Um, that kind of discipline was really... Um, it varied, you know, and it, there were times where the party was, the group, the group was quite strict and other times where it was not as, as good at, at, at holding its members accountable. And now we see that it's almost like a valve is turned, uh, that uh, since 2015, 
which is when I've been really following what the Mbonera Kure have been doing. I'm, I'm very interested to hear that they've been actively involved in, in committing violence well before 2015. Um, but in the last uh, four years or so, um, there have been incidences of reports where the Mbonara Kure are searching an area or trying to intimidate a community, uh, trying to really um, kind of informally police the community and, and make sure that people living there are loyal and, and remain faithful to CMDD FDD, do not hide supporters, do not uh, support the opposition. Hmm. Um, and then you hear of incidences where uh, women and girls are taken and, and raped. Um, and it's very difficult to follow this. Um, obviously, there's very little accountability on the ground. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm utterly convinced that the victims or the survivors of, of these incidences are really finding it difficult to report to authorities because obviously the Mbonera Kure enjoys the protection of the police and state and military structures, which are under, you know, relatively under the control yeah. of the ruling party. Well, look, all three of you have also mentioned this very big issue of refugees, and there's a huge amount of them in, in Tanzania particularly, um, and, and a large number of them are now slowly starting to come back. I, I want to take a look at some of these numbers. So tens of thousands of people who fled political violence have now been slowly returning to Burundi, and most of them are coming back from camps in Tanzania, Rwanda, Uganda, and Democratic Republic of Congo. The UN is helping with the repatriation of more than 300,000 people who've fled since 2015, but there are concerns that Burundi's neighbors may be forcing the refugees to go back home before it's safe to do so, especially now with this election um, coming up next year. Jonathan. How voluntary are these repatriations? Um, I cannot um, ascertain how voluntary they are. But um, uh, with all, under normal circumstances, you know, every uh, re uh, return, um, re refugee return to um, Burundi should be voluntary. There should be no enforced repatriations into the country. To answer your question, I do not know whether these re re repatriations are forced or are voluntary or forced. But in any way, I'm not sure so the I'm government not. can um, can force any Burundian refugee outside the country mm. to return to the country against their will. So any return re refugee return into Burundi, I believe, is voluntary. Well, obviously, all of this is taking place with the backdrop of the election that's coming up, which is set to take place now in May 2020. And as you've alluded to, and Kuruziza has said that he won't run um, in the, the, the next election, despite the fact that he has now potentially extended, well, the possibility of his term after a constitutional referendum last year. So, Lewis, let me ask you this. What's going on here? Why isn't Kuruziza saying that he isn't going to run despite having gone to the trouble of having a constitutional referendum? Does this mean that there's some kind of dissent within the ruling party, that we could see more conflict even within the ranks of the CNDD, FDD? Sure, uh, happy to answer that. But I just, I do want to just jump on that last subject for just a moment. Um, we are documenting refugees who are being forced out, pressured by the Tanzanian government. So I want to be very clear on that point. Uh, last month, there were between two and 300 returnees that we documented who told us that the Tanzanian authorities came to the camp and said, leave. You will be withheld benefits. We, won't, we are not going to feed you. You won't be allowed to leave the camp, and we're going to close down the markets. So we are documenting a real pressure. Um, and, and just on this issue again, just this month, uh, we've spoken with seven refugees who've returned to Burundi, and they're given very meager kits by UNHCR, the refugee agency okay. of the United Nation, uh, a cash equivalent of $37 and some basic provisions. All of those were taken by the Mbonara Kuri, and these seven individuals were threatened to the point where they fled again. So this, uh, this, this, this aspect of refugees, especially with Tanzania, which is an ally of Burundi, mm. the Magufuli government has declared they don't want any more Burundian refugees on their territory. Uh, this issue is not going to go away anytime soon, I think. Um, and, and I do think we need to be cognizant of the fact that um, there is a real pressure to force these per people to return. 
um, who really don't want to, but they're given no viable options um, in Tanzania. To your point about Nkurunziza, I, I'm, I'm a bit more pessimistic about him not running. Um, I, I acknowledge that he did say he was not going to run. But this is a standard playbook from the region. We've seen Museveni use the same type of language in the past in Uganda. Kagame recently in Rwanda said he certainly wasn't going to run. And then they did the exact same thing. They had a constitutional referendum and he ran for president again. I wouldn't be surprised in the slightest if in the next few months we start to see spontaneous um, manifestation, spontaneous protest of the of the people demanding that Nkurunziza run again. Um, this is something that's been done in the past. Um, we've seen it before, and, and I wouldn't be surprised. Now, if failing that, um, there's his wife has been rumored to step up next to him, or perhaps the, the current head of the CNDD FTD, the current head of the party. But I do not think for a moment these elections will be free and fair, even if Nkurunziza is outside. Um, and we see that because of the repression on the few remaining individuals who dare to consider themselves political opponents in the country now. Um, and, and I don't think uh, I don't think we're going to see any mm. real opening of the political space. I think this space is going to continue to be completely controlled by CNDD FTD and its in its close cadres. Well, within this climate of fear that we've heard about, talked, well, discussed repeatedly by various people, both inside and outside Burundi, um, there has been this ongoing crackdown and seemingly an intensification of this crackdown. We've seen um, several different officers of the newly registered opposition party be burned down. The government investigated, I believe it was several members of the opposition who were then imprisoned, um, blamed for attacking themselves, essentially. Um, Angela, talk us through how that works for the opposition. They've said that they won't be intimidated, that they will continue to operate. Is that realistic? Well, I think that the, the opposition is, um, I mean, it's in a very difficult, it's in disarray to some extent. I think that the, the tactics of the government or the ruling party um, are incredibly destabilizing. Uh, we, we see an opposition in Burundi, which is both inside the country and outside the country, uh, we see that multi-ethnic coalitions, for example, which could have had a, a more constructive role in sort of a more bipartisan approach to democratization, um, face new hurdles as a result of the constitutional uh, 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 reform. Um, we see that, you know, that, that parties outside in particular tend have been fragmenting uh, and I think that in general, I think that the arrests of, of leaders, the, the inability to really assemble um, and to maintain political organization in, in, out in the open mm. really weakens the opposition. It, 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 it doesn't make it really possible for uh, opposition leaders to uh, campaign, to, to mobilize, support, mm. uh, to question uh, government policies. It, it, it really, it, it, it really calls into question what kind of elections will, mm. really will take place in 2020. Jonathan, I'm going to ask you because you you, re, you alluded earlier to potential action needing to be taken by the regional community and the international community. And I'm going to ask you very briefly here because the the inter Burundi dialogue that was being led by the East African community basically has failed. Um, the African Union has had human rights observers in country, but they haven't released a public report pretty much ever. And you've talked about this culture of impunity, right? So this isn't just about abuses taking place. It's about the, the atmosphere within which that happens. So what, what room is there now for, for action to take place? The UN Security Council also has done very little. Why the silence and where do we go from here? Well, you know, there's this culture, as we are, there's this culture of um, African countries not interfering um, in the internal affairs of other, uh, of other countries and so on and so forth, unless the situation becomes very, very critical before, you know, any, like the AU or any other country would, mm. um, will step in to try and resolve the situation, right? And as the other, um, my colleague mentioned, Tanzania Magafuli, it's not an ally of um, Nkuruziza, mm. right? And uh, Museveni, who was uh, appointed to spearhead the dialogue, has uh, done practically next to nothing. Okay, so it appears the world is going to sit by and watch, you know, this impunity continue mm. and watch these human rights abuses uh, to continue. 
you know, until it gets to a critical stage before they step in. What I, I believe should be done is uh, that the, the AU and then the regional economic and political grouping should take preemptive um, measures right, to foresaw any um, 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 recurrence of what happened in 2015 or even worse. Hmm. And we'll have to leave it there, but it is something that we'll all continue to watch very, very closely indeed. Thank you to all our guests, Angela movumba Selstrom, Jonathan ofe Antha, and Lewis Mudge. And thank you too for watching. You can see this programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Nastasia Tay, and the whole team here in Doha, bye for now.